Welcome to another broadcast from MindYourHealthCast.com. I guess you uh, have been following some of my material if you're watching this, or maybe this is your first time. At any rate, if it's not your first time, you know the type of material we've been bringing, all related to health in some way. And uh, if you haven't, uh, it would be worth your while, at least I think so, to go back through my um, archived videos that are on YouTube and get a good basic education in natural health. Now, I offer my information, suggestions, results of my studies and research, but at the same time, I provoke you to go look for yourself. Don't take it because I said it, but go see if you can find whether that is supported uh, by the research that's out uh, and compare a lot of different people. Now, as you've probably learned by now, if you've done any searching on the internet, that you're going to find every viewpoint in the spectrum from um, those who uh, will say absolutely you must do something to the other end that says absolutely you must never do that same thing. And so it can be confusing and you have to watch because there are some people on the internet who uh, really aren't researchers, but they like to side with the side of the standard position. And when you read their site, you would swear that, wow, this, this person is really a, a high-level researcher, when in fact, all they're doing is just repeating other people and standing with them and then of course making a lot of insulting remarks to those who don't agree. Um, I think that's kind of a giveaway. You don't have to insult other people who disagree. You present your information and the reasons why you are thinking that direction and allow other people to do the same and it doesn't mean they're stupid or uh, uh, ignorant or so biased they can't see just because they may disagree with the standard position, whatever that may be. Now to those of you who have been around a long time, I'm sure you by now realize that the standard position changes all the time as time goes on and we learn more. So what we would like to say is that this is information and understanding in transition which means as we learn more, we are forced to, if we're open and honest, we're forced to change our position. Unless you are a part of some religion which is unbendable, and in this particular case, I'm talking about the religion of science, scientism, or the scientific religion, or those people who claim under color of science to be giving you absolute facts when in fact what they're really giving you is their opinions and they have decided what's real and what isn't real and therefore what they decide isn't real is automatically excluded from any of their studies and hence uh, I have great questions as to their true scientific uh, opinions because of the fact that they've already decided in advance what cannot be true and if that's the case, then uh, to me that's not objective science. Anyhow, I've chosen for our subject today epigenetics, DNA, and life. Um, the term DNA has been thrown about so much that uh, there's hardly anybody, I suppose, that hasn't heard of it if they've been reading, listening, talking to anybody at all, or watching any of the news or the media. Frequently DNA is thrown up and of course the alternative term genes uh, is thrown up and so after a while uh, we've gotten quite used to having some blip come on. Well, scientists have isolated a gene related to obesity and uh, scientists have uh, found the gene related to depression and we came to accept that DNA is an absolute final authority on how we um, develop and how we behave and what type of problems we in, encounter in our life. Uh, it's, there's almost the religion of DNA. 
the reason I'm bringing this up is my real subject, of course, is epigenetics. Uh, epa meaning around or above genetics. Now, if you remember the history, uh, well, maybe part of it got left out for you. Way back in the late 1700s, um, I would say it had become an accepted fact that each generation or offspring bring in with them certain characteristics and likenesses of their parents and their grandparents and so forth. And so they knew that, they, that you inherited, they just weren't sure how and what was going on. Now, around the turn of that century, into the 1800s, uh, about 1801, there was a researcher out of France by the name of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And Lamarck uh, came up with the idea, well, yeah, we do inherit uh, certain factors, however, um, our body has the capability of adapting to the new environment and out of that ad adaptation it alters our um, pool of information in such a way that the next generation has benefit. So if we are forced to have to adapt to eating something different and we do make an adaptation it somehow changes our gene. Now, they, in some cases, they were talking about genes because they didn't know what they were talking about because they weren't for sure it was. They just knew that there was something that kind of carried some information that passed on. And so he said that, it, that, that we are constantly changing, which had become evident for anyone who observed the history of man, that the man changed over time. Uh, he said that it was because we adapted to what was in our environment uh, and out of that ad adaptation we in some way changed our code so that the next generations then as I say would benefit from it. Now there was no question that we changed at that point and a lot of people didn't like that idea because they were beginning to think more and more that everything is fixed, that we don't really have a lot of choices. And so along came uh, Charles Darwin, and now that was around 1859 that he uh, published his material called The Theory of Evolution, uh, in which he said, in other words, the word evolution, I know some religious people get quite upset about evolution, to evolve means to change. Now, within that theory of change, you have Lamarck who's saying we have the capability of adapting to our environment and then passing it on. But a lot of the people in the scientific field at that point, who where they were just beginning to learn some things, and uh, they didn't like that so well. And so what they ended up, they grabbed on to Darwin's idea that it's true that we change, but the way we change is because the replication of whatever that information is, whatever that gene is that carries a piece of information, can in some cases encounter a random error, and that error actually makes us, um, if we're lucky, more adaptable to changing conditions. Those that don't make the change die off, and those who do make the change, then they keep passing it on, and it becomes a new trait for new generations. So he said it was absolutely random. We had no choice in the matter. It just happened, and if we were lucky and it was a good mutation, then things were great. If it wasn't, then we would expire, and that whole line would die out because it was not adapted to what was going on. So there was this big fight back and forth. Well, ultimately the scientific community liked Darwin's idea better than Lamarck, and so the, the name of Lamarck and his ideas kind of fell into oblivion. And so in most cases I don't think it's even taught. I, I remember when I was growing up, um, they never talked about Lamarck in any of the programs I had in biology or uh, science of any sort. And uh, he just wasn't known. But 
Um, as time has gone on, um, we first of all began to get enough information together to decipher what it was that was really carrying that information. And so, uh, in 1953, by that time, we had learned a couple of things. We had learned, first of all, that there were something called nucleic acids. And we had also learned um, that those nucleic acids were capable of joining together in certain, some form, which wasn't known yet, that could carry information. And so there was a big race to decipher exactly how this all came about. How did it come together and how did it work? And so Linus Pauling, who had um, received a couple of Nobel Prizes, was in this contest, so to speak, within the scientific community to try to come up with a um, answer as to how these nucleic acids figured in this genetic code. And um, they were all working away. Over in England, uh, there were some scientists who uh, were heavily into it. Um, and there was a, a scientist by the name of Franklin who was doing X-ray crystallography, uh, trying to determine the structure of DNA uh, by shining an X-ray through crystals of DNA and, and noting how they were deflected. She was trying to decode a pattern. Now, they, they finally arrived at the idea that it was some type of a helical form, but they weren't sure. Was it a double helix, a triple helix, or what? Meaning, did it have more than one backbone? And so that had not been determined. And so all these scientists were in this race to determine, and they were sure that whoever who, uh, cracked this code would end up getting a Nobel Prize. Well, there was two young uh, students at Cambridge. Uh, one was uh, named Watson and the other Crick. Now, Watson uh, was from the U.S. over in Great Britain studying, and Crick was from Great Britain. And uh, the two of them became friends, and they got very involved in trying to decipher this code. Well, anyhow, bottom line is, without going into all the details, Linus Pauling came up with a theory and published it because of his stature at that time of being such a recognized scientist and he hypothesized it was going to be a triple helix uh, which actually when Watson and Crick looked at what he published they said uh oh he wrote the book on molecular bonding and um, it appears that he violated his own principles that he had established so I know it's not a triple helix as it ended up, uh, Pauling was a bit embarrassed over the fact that uh, that wasn't the code and that he had violated his own principles of bonding. At any rate, they kept playing with it. They made cardboard models of the nucleic acids and their uh, linkage capability based on the electrical charges and so forth. And so they played with it on a table, kind of like a uh, jigsaw puzzle. And all of a sudden one day, zang, it all came together how they would work and then when they looked at all of the evidence, it fit all the evidence and so they very rapidly went and um, published um, their concept of the DNA and sure enough that ended up being what was accepted and sure enough they ended up receiving a Nobel Prize. And so that was published in 1953. So once that happened, all the scientists jumped in and said, wow, we've got it now, we know what it's all about. These genes code for all these different things and that's the whole secret. And all we have to do is crack the code and know uh, what each of those genes code for and we've got it made. Okay, so that brings us up <clears throat> to what has led to current theories up until recent times by the standard scientific community. Now at this point we want to interject something beyond that which has come to the foreground and some of this material is covered very well in a book that I've mentioned before called The Basic Code of the Universe 
The Science of the Invisible in Physics, Medicine, and Spirituality, written by Massimo Citro, MD, uh, and with a foreword by Dr. Irvin Laszlo, which, uh, if you recall, I've mentioned before. Anyhow, uh, there's, a, there's a big section in there on DNA and genetics, and especially in epigenetics. Now, once it became apparent there were certain uh, problems, that's how they began to realize that maybe it wasn't quite as cut and dried as they had thought. And, um, however, there was a period of time, and I'm sure some of you remember that, when many of the um, scientists uh, said, what we need to do is we need to map the human genome, which is what are the genes within the genetic code that make us a human being. And once we map that, then we're going to be able to know um, how to intervene to make corrections in genet genetics or genetic therapy. And so there was a lot of excitement and a lot of anticipation that they were going to be able to, especially the pharmaceuticals, make a fortune uh, by being able to um, determine what genes were related to what problems and then replace those genes or in some way alter them and, of course, their anticipation is, wow, this is like a whole new realm of pharmacology. We'll be able to really make some big money with that. And so even the first tests to determine pieces of the genetic code, in other words, how to check for certain uh, genes on certain sections of the code without going into any of the technical details. And so they started this big project called the Human Genome Project. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to uh, uh, have a market, really. That's, that was the bottom line, is that they wanted to have a market for dr new drugs that would somehow alter the genetic code and make change. And so they started doing actually experiments in ways to alter it. Uh, sometimes they would uh, connect a piece of genetic information to a virus and inject it into a cell and hope that the virus would carry the piece of genetic information into the gene and they tried bacterial forms, a lot of different things they were working with at that point. Uh, however, uh, they didn't really know how many genes were in the code. So the, the, the whole code, um, they were figuring the genome project they had an estimation about how many genes they probably were going to find. Now they originally uh, said, well we know there's about at least a hundred thousand proteins in the body, so if we have a gene to code for each of those uh, factors, then we're going to have at least a hundred thousand genes to code for a hundred thousand proteins. We sur surmise that there's regulator genes and so that might take up to another 25,000. So they were estimating, well, when we get done, we're going to uh, uh, have at least 125,000 genes in the human genome. And so hopes and expectations were big and a lot of research went on and there was a lot of talk, a lot of news blips, a lot of articles. Uh, how great it's going to be, we're coming down toward the end, we're going to have it all mapped and we're going to be able to uh, um, do all these great new things. And of course the public was enamored because they're saying, wow, now we're going to be able to get to the core of this so that even when we inherit a problem, they'll be able to correct it. So everything sounded like utopia. Um, finally, after many, many years, they ended up mapping the human genome. Okay, so now all of a sudden as they sat down and looked at it, there was a droop in their demeanor because instead of 125,000 genes or more, at least according to a government website on DNA and the Gen Genome Project, they're saying they, they ended up with 20,500. 
Uh, now, if that's the case, there wasn't even enough to code for regulator, let alone the 100,000 proteins. So, all of a sudden, there's a big hole in the gene for this, gene for that idea. So, if you've paid attention over recent years, you've probably noticed that bit by bit it's quieted down. Now, they published this back in 2003. So, here it is 2013 heading toward 2014 and you don't hear so much about all the great things they're going to be doing with uh, the genes. Now, there's a few people who still talk about it a little. But you don't see the big enthusiasm because what they realized is they really didn't understand how the whole thing works. Uh, in fact, if there's only 20,500, th how in the world can that small number of genes code for 100,000 proteins? If there's a gene for this and a gene for that. So right away there's a big hole in the theory. And so they've been kind of quiet about it, but then some researchers came up with an idea which is quite interesting because it's not a new idea. Um, and it goes back uh, a piece, in fact, to the 1800s, and that was when um, Dr. Hahnemann, Dr. Friedrich Samuel Hahnemann, actually it was Christian Friedrich Samuel Hahnemann, who was the originator of the field or uh, theory, which is actually more than theory, it works, uh, of homeopathic medicine. He developed all those concepts. Well, after he developed that, now see, back then, of course, they, it was still up in the air that they were wrestling with um, uh, Lamarckism versus uh, Darwinism. Uh, they, everybody realized that something passed on. Okay, so anyhow, he was developed homeopathic medicine as a way of helping people get well, and they did. Uh, people that had been being treated by purging and bleeding and large doses of mummy and purges and emetics, in other words, making you vomit or have severe diarrhea or uh, bleeding out some blood or trepanning where they drill a hole through the skull to let out the vapor so that you get rid of a headache. I mean, these were a lot of the practices that were going on in medicine. And uh, he, he didn't like what he saw was happening. Dr. Hahnemann didn't, so having been fluent in three, four, or five languages and besides German, which of course he was, um, he started, after he became a medical doctor, he didn't want anything to do with the way they were practicing it or treating people, so he started earning his living translating medical books from one language to another. And without going into all the details and so forth, he developed a system of medicine referred to as homeopathic medicine whereby he actually helped people get well. Um, so everything looked rosy for him at that point until uh, at some point some of the patients after a few years came back and they were starting to develop the same problem that they had had before. And he said, well, gee, something isn't right because if they were cured, then they should not have the problem come back. And it perplexed him to the point that at a certain time he said, I've got to look into this deeper. I can't treat any more people till I find out what's going on. So he decided to stop treating for a period of, I think it was at least six months, maybe longer. And uh, he sat down and analyzed every patient's case that he had ever treated. He, in other words, he kept very meticulous files because the only way they had, they didn't do laboratory tests, they didn't do diagnostic imaging, they didn't do uh, all these kind of things, so he worked from symptoms. The symptom gave him a picture of what was going on in the person and that picture then led him to the right remedy to take which would help the body to correct it. And it worked very well, except now they're coming back and he said that couldn't be if we've cured them. And so, as he looked into it deeper, he found that there were some deeper patterns that began to emerge. And those deeper patterns, he began to realize, had to do uh, with um, something that they had brought in with them into their life. Now, remember again, there, there was some knowledge about there must be some kind of genes or something to carry information, but nobody really knew for sure what it was. As I say, Lamarck had an idea, 
uh, Darwin, but it still there was a lot not known, and it wasn't until the 1950s that it really they got down to a specific DNA code. Well, at any rate, um, he recognized that these patterns ran consistent with different people, and he isolated three basic patterns, which he called miasms. And miasm means an inherited taint. In other words, you brought in something with you that predisposed you to having certain types of problems. And so these three that he developed, these three my miasms, in my mind, are uh, was the forerunner of the whole idea of epigenetics. Because as we talk a little bit about it, and we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about it because there's always too much to talk about. Um, <clears throat> But at any rate, uh, he then felt that as you cleaned up some of the basic acquired things, it took you back at some point to these inherited things. And those inherited things, those miasms then, had to have uh, uh, certain remedies that would then neutralize or correct or wipe out those miasmic or inherited things. Now the nice thing about it is if you if you cleaned out men and women before they had children, you then wiped out that tendency to be passed on to them. And so uh, as time went on they were starting to develop some people that were actually making the status of health of the humankind better by eradicating those miasms. Well, anyhow, he was poo-pooed by a lot of the regular medical establishment who thought you needed to take these large doses of chemicals and you needed to do a lot of cutting and drilling holes and bleeding and all this uh, to relieve people of their misery. Now, they, they, they didn't, uh, I don't believe, think it was really curing, but they felt it gave them relief so that they felt a little better. Although I don't know about drilling a hole in the skull if that would leave you with any permanent <laughs> improvements at all and might be very serious in my mind. Anyhow, uh, so the, I think he laid the groundwork for what later became known as epigenetics. Um, there's a section here and, and I was just going to read you from um, the book by Dr. Citro and, and this is an extremely good book. If you want to understand really about true medicine and how it works and from some very powerful pioneers in research. These are all MDs uh, from Italy and some from France and um, they have put all this material together in this book called The Basic Code of the Universe. Very good book to read. Some of it you may have to wrestle with if you're not familiar with some of the energetic concepts but they do have a section on epigenetics which is why I'm mentioning them. But here's where it all got to. The Human Genome Project argues that genes absolutely control all the processes of heredity and life. How can they if human genes number only 30,000? Now he's giving them 30,000 but according to the US government it's only 20,500. Almost as many as those in a mustard plant and twice as many genes as that of a fly or a worm. If we consider life only from the genetic point of view, a human could easily be mistaken for a mouse whose genes are 99% similar. We would then need to accept the theory of alternative splicing according to which a single gene can encode thousands of different proteins, thus contradicting the theory of Francis Crick who co-discovered DNA. It is not believable, however, that the effect of a gene can predict, be predicted only on the basis of its molecular sequence. In recent years, the role of DNA has been redimensionalized uh, along with the dominance of the gene. All of molecular biology is faltering. And then he says, according to Barry Commoner, the director of the Critical Genetic Project of Queens College in New York, it is not the DNA molecule alone that duplicates but the entire living cell in its complexity. So here again is something, the system itself as a whole that could direct the operation. So then enter epigenetics. Um, ever since James Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA, genetic stability has been attributed to the double helix, 
with self-replication and mutations regarded as random errors, getting back to, to uh, Darwin. In other words, the genes have been considered as the stable units of the transmission of hereditary characteristics. Remember, however, some people think that they are not the only ones responsible for life. And so then he goes on to just talk about what they've discovered. He um, gives a lot of good information about the Hall dogma. And so it's an extremely good book to read. Um, a lot of references to other research and so forth. So I, I think you will find it extremely helpful. But the bottom line is, in, in a nutshell, Epigenetics is the idea that we inherit um, from our ancestral background certain informational imprints that determine how the genes express. And so what they found is that something triggers one gene which in turn triggers two or three other genes which in turn triggers two or three other genes which actually carry out the command. But what does all that see? They're running a big problem, and so that's where it, epigenetics. So we've inherited something that affects our behavior and our health, our physical health, uh, that can affect the way these codes are utilized in our body, turning off certain ones and expressing certain ones. And there's a whole mechanism involved in this, and it's, it's quite exciting because what they're saying in my mind is exactly the same as Hahnemann was saying back in the 1800s. We inherit these taints or disturbances from our ancestry which determine how our particular body uses the genetic code that we have received on top of it. So we're talking about a double whammy and so now the whole idea of well we're going to do this and correct that gene and therefore we'll correct your health doesn't hold much water and I think that uh, we're not going to find the so-called expensive genetic therapies both to do the tests and to take the therapies. I know the pharmaceutical industry was thinking they were going to make a killing off of this but as of now uh, there's a lot of big questions. Now I met the author of one of the books on epigenetics uh, it's called The Genie and Your Genes and it's written by Dawson Church, PhD. I met him before at a, actually one of the uh, conferences of anti-aging. And he says, and epigenetic medicine and the new biology of intention. Now, what you're going to find is that not only can the epigenetics be altered by you, uh, but you're altering them, then can pass them on to your progeny when you have children if you do so. So, very good book. There is a second edition of it and that's the one you would want to get and it should be on our list as far as I know. There is another pretty new one out called The Ultimate Mystery of Inheritance, Epigenetics by Richard C. Francis. And, but there's a lot more. But these are just two that I think are pretty good. Church has done a good job and he introduces some different ways of altering or affecting genes. So when you get the feeling, well, I can't do anything about it because it's genetic and therefore I'm stuck with it, it's not really true because what you're going to find that either you creating an epigenetic intent that can make change or what you brought with you uh, are either going to affect genetic expression and that if, if it can be created by intent, it can be changed by intent. So what I'm saying is we have the capability of making big change in ourselves. Now there's another book out called The Biology of Belief by, uh, uh, his name just went out of my head just like that, uh, Bruce Lipton. And he gets into some information too about how the whole function is affected by environment, meaning what you eat and there's there's... Uh, a lot of information now coming out about how the genetics and the expression of genetics is affected by diet as well as our mental states. So what it does is it puts it back in our lap and saying it's our body, our health, our emotions and we're responsible for them but we can change it. I don't care what we brought in, we have the capability of making tremendous change. So once we understand the freedom that we have to be healthy we understand how important it is when we were talking about mind-body medicine earlier and how for 3,000 years it's been known and there's been writings about 
the mind-body relationship. So I think you'll find the whole subject fascinating, and of course within this short time we hardly had time to give it great detailed attention, but on the other hand we don't want to make it too detailed that it scares you off. But if you get these three books alone, The Basic Code of the Universe by Citro, Epigenetics by Francis, and The Genie and the Genes by uh, Church, you're going to get a pretty good education and a pretty decent understanding of the whole subject. Anyhow, it was nice to be with you. I see, according to the ticker on the wall, that it's time to fold it up for another week. So I hope I have given you some provocative information uh, and some helpful information. And of course I leave it in your lap. You, you can hang on to um, the Darwin concepts if you want, or you can look at, interestingly, how things are changed. Now see, I've gone through all those transitions. I was around before Watson and Crick's material. Uh, I was taught all of the what was the science of the day, and of course the interesting thing, the science of today is the fiction of tomorrow, uh, because as new information comes along, it's always outdating the science of yesterday. So this of course is why I'm so emphatic about keeping your mind open, watching what's going on, and being flexible to adapt to the new research, the new ideas that are coming out, and not be so locked in, unless you have joined the uh, church and the religion of scientism and you are one of those people who believe that science is the know-all and all-powerful and absolute, then of course I guess you have to go that direction and there's some that do that and that's fine if that's your choice. At any rate, those who want to be liberated uh, and uh, be open to new ideas, I think this is a good jumping off point to give you a little bit of freedom and relief to think, boy, I'm not stuck with all this stuff. I have some choices and options. Okay, we've used up our time. Don't forget to go to our website, mindyourhealthcast.com. Uh, you can leave your comments, you can send us emails, you can go uh, to the Alternative Health and Prevention by a link from that website about the office and the clinic that I operate. And hopefully, uh, if you read through the pages of Mind Your Healthcast, uh, we keep putting different information on that you'll find some interesting information in your pursuit for your own personal health. So, until next broadcast, be healthy.